scientists are at a loss to explain what is causing this weather. So you can get to a situation where it just, the oceans will begin to boil. So now we come to the question of what the consequences of climate change will be. I think we can safely say that the oceans won't boil and we won't all drown. And neither will the earth blow up, as this blog claims. Of course, it's possible under the principle that anything is possible, but these are claims that aren't supported by the scientific literature, even when they're made in blogs dressed up to look like scientific papers. So let's leave aside the controversy and the speculation and simply look at what will happen according to scientific research published in respected peer-reviewed journals. The first and most obvious consequence is that warmer temperatures will cause ice caps to melt and this melt will cause sea levels to rise. We can see how this has happened in the past, most recently at the end of the last glaciation when sea levels rose about 200 feet. Now it's hard to argue that melting ice won't cause sea levels to rise, so the only way to get around the rising sea levels problem is to try to argue that the ice isn't melting. You've seen those headlines about global warming. The glaciers are melting. We're doomed. That's what several studies supposedly found. But other scientific studies found exactly the opposite. Greenland's glaciers are growing, not melting. No, no scientific study has found that. Not even the paper cited in this video by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. It's the same paper cited by Moncton to make exactly the same claim. And just like Moncton, the makers of the video didn't actually read the paper before jumping to their conclusion. The research paper only looked at the interior of Greenland at higher altitude. And the author, Johannesson, specifically warns against drawing the conclusion that there's no net melting based only on the limited scope of the study. Because, of course, ice is melting, or more technically ablating, from the lower altitude coastal areas of Greenland, and it's melting much faster than it's accumulating. A regular on my channel, 1000 Frolly, accepts that there's a net loss of ice from Greenland, but says it's made up for by ice gain in Antarctica. And he cites a source, a blog by William Robert Johnson, who gives us the benefit of his expertise on everything from abortion to Daedalus-class starships used in Star Trek. It's impossible to know how Johnson derived his figures, but it doesn't matter. The fact that his figures start 15 years before there was any measurable warming of the atmosphere, and long before there was any serious attempt at measuring the ice loss, and they end five years before Frolly thinks they do, and they're based on Johnson's own extrapolation of what he admits is a limited amount of data going back that far, and that Johnson himself emphasizes that these figures should only be regarded as illustrative, explains why it's never a good idea to quote the conclusions of a blogger as if they were proper scientific research. If you want to play scientist, you have to actually read the scientific literature and quote that. So what does the scientific literature say? Well, just as in the highlands of Greenland, researchers have determined that ice is growing in areas like East Antarctica and high-altitude glaciers, probably, they say, because warmer air is able to hold more moisture, and that means more snow. But in West Antarctica, the coastal areas of Greenland and lower glaciers, the ice is melting. As in Greenland, the question is, is the amount of cap ice melting worldwide greater than the amount accumulating? And the answer, based on these measurements rather than the blogs, is yes, by about 4.3 trillion tonnes in seven years, or about 150 cubic miles a year. Before I move on, a quick word from those who exaggerate the effects of global warming. According to Global Warming Siren, polar ice caps could vanish within five years, and that was back in 2010. The source? Al Gore. As always, we need to check the primary source. Gore bases his claim on a study by Wieslaw Maslowski. What Gore didn't mention was that most studies disagree with this conclusion. They predict an ice-free North Pole is several decades away, as Maslowski himself acknowledges. So the same message goes out to the climate exaggerators. Stop quoting blogs and politicians and start reading the scientific literature if you're going to take it upon yourselves to report on climate change. By the way, melting sea ice makes no difference to sea levels because the ice is already in the sea. It's cap ice that makes the difference. 
With 150 cubic miles of this ice melting every year, basic physics tells us that this will cause sea levels to rise. And basic physics also tells us that as water warms up, it expands. So on top of the rise due to ice melt, researchers say sea levels will also rise because of thermal expansion. There are two ways to calculate this. One is to estimate how much ice will melt and how much the oceans will expand for a given rise in temperature. And that gives us a figure of between 0.8 and 2 metres by the end of the century, depending on how much CO2 is pumped into the atmosphere. Another way of estimating it is to see how much sea levels rose in the past for a given rise in temperature, and that gives a similar range between 1 and 2 metres by the end of this century. 0.8 metres, the low end of the estimates, may not sound like much. It's about 3 feet. But it's enough to submerge large areas of coastline, including parts of coastal cities like Miami, Guangzhou, New York and Calcutta, and Tokyo, Hong Kong, Bangkok, New Orleans, Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Two metres, the high end of the scale, is over six feet. Still, the urban myths persist. And who better to demonstrate them than our old friend 1000 Frolly, who calls my reporting on sea level rise misleading tosh. Potty's claim of a 100 centimetre rise, that's a metre, by 2100 is pure fiction based on IPCC alarmism. Well, first of all, of course, this isn't my claim. I'm just doing what I always do in my videos, which is to report what's published in the scientific literature. Secondly, I don't use the IPCC as a source. My sources are either listed in the video description or the videos themselves. So this can only be misleading tosh if I've misreported the papers, which apparently I haven't, or if other research rebuts it, which Frolly seems to think it does. He cites a paper by Lulietta and Nerem at the University of Colorado, which has a unit dedicated to sea level change. The quote shows that if you look at sea level changes, which have been rising for the past 20 years, according to this graph by the University of Colorado, and then pick out carefully selected years, it appears as though future sea level increases are in decline. It's such a convoluted, cherry-picked and weird way of doing science I was astonished that respected researchers like Nerem and Juliet would write anything so ridiculous. And of course they didn't. The conclusion and the quote come, no surprise, from the blogosphere. In this case, a website called climate for You, run by the political lobby group Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. And even climate for You agrees that deriving figures in this weird and convoluted way is not realistic. The real forecast by the University of Colorado is the one Frolly said was tosh and misleading nonsense, 0.8 to 2 meters. Once again, it illustrates the danger of trusting a blogger to tell you what's in the scientific literature. But let's go on to some good news. More CO2 is definitely good for plant growth because plants depend on carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Experiments have shown that plants grow much better in higher concentrations of CO2, which is why nurseries often pump CO2 into greenhouses. Higher CO2 also allows plants to open their pores less widely, which means they won't lose so much water to evapotranspiration. And in higher latitudes, plants grow faster in warmer temperatures. According to the Daily Mail, global warming would boost Britain's farm crops by 10%. What's the mail source? Well, it's quoting a study by the Met Office, Britain's meteorological office, which found that seasonal frosts would start later and finish earlier, and that's definitely good for plant growth. Trouble is, other predictions in the same Met Office report look a bit grimmer, like water shortages, flooding and heat stress. And it turns out that crop losses due to these other factors more than offset the gains illustrated in the male headline because of warmer temperatures. The male does report these negative effects, but further down in the story. Yes, some things like increased CO2 and fewer frosts will boost crop production. Other things like more frequent drought, stronger hurricanes, rising sea levels, heat stress, salination and increased flooding will reduce it. And it's the drought and the flooding that have the experts concerned. So let's look at that. As I said, higher temperatures mean the air can hold more water vapour, about 7.5% more for every degree centigrade rise. So you'd think that would cause more rainfall. Well, yes, it will, say climatologists, 
but only in certain areas. Here's why. As the world gets warmer, the extreme latitudes warm faster than lower latitudes. As a result, global air circulation will slow down because it's the difference in temperature that drives winds. The problem is, even rainfall relies on the circulation of humid air. If the circulation slows down, then air masses will tend to stay put. As a rule of thumb, dry regions will get drier and wet regions will get wetter. To see what that'll look like, the Met Office combined a number of studies from different countries. It shows Britain getting much wetter in the winter, but drier in the summer in the south of England. North America gets much wetter in the north and east, much drier in the south and west. To see what might happen in your own country, the link is in my video description. Remember, this isn't one model, it's an amalgam of many different studies showing how much their conclusions agree or disagree. And although there's still disagreement in marginal areas, and this is, after all, a model, there's little disagreement that the world is headed for more extremes in precipitation based on simple physical principles. So to claim that more CO2 and a warming climate will boost food production, either in the UK or worldwide, is not based on any study that takes into account other factors that affect plant growth. This study by Parry et al., for example, shows the effect on cereal crops worldwide over the next 70 years. It shows that drought, flooding and heat stress will more than offset the benefits derived from higher concentrations of CO2 for plant growth. I won't have time to get into all the effects of climate change in this video. There are simply too many. For example, a lot of places that depend on meltwater from glaciers will see that source dry up. Oceans are slowly acidifying as more CO2 is dissolved, and that's causing problems for coral and plankton growth. As corals begin to die, more coastal land is exposed to erosion from waves and storm surges. Ecosystems are being disrupted as organisms become extinct, because it's not just the rise in temperatures that's a problem. Temperatures have risen much more in the past. It's the rate at which they're rising that's causing problems for organisms that can't move fast enough to adapt. As for hurricanes, as I showed in a previous video, they'll be less frequent, but the ones that do occur will be much stronger. A warmer Arctic will send winter Arctic weather further south. Before you start wondering how Georgia and West Virginia can possibly get colder in winter if the world is supposed to be getting warmer, remember it's called global warming because the whole globe is warming on average. So although temperatures may have been way below average where you were this winter, it was way above average further north in the Arctic. But there is one effect of global warming that seems the most innocuous but may end up being the most damaging of all. Warming the planet leads to a phenomenon called positive feedback, which amplifies the warming. So as ice melts, there's less of a white surface on the Earth to reflect the sun's energy and more dark water to absorb it. That warms the Earth even further. As the tundra warms, permafrost melts and releases methane, another powerful greenhouse gas that warms the Earth even more. And as the oceans warm, they become less able to absorb CO2, which is less soluble in warmer water, and that causes higher concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, which warms the Earth further. So now we come to the really important question, at least to climate critics. What should we call this? In the past, the term used for anthropogenic global warming was a simple acronym, AGW. But in 2007, the term CAGW was coined. That's catastrophic anthropogenic global warming. The argument now seems to be that, OK, anthropogenic global warming might be real. I suppose that's progress. But it's not going to be catastrophic. Now, I can't tell you whether the effects we'll see from climate change will be catastrophic because I don't know what the climate critics mean by it. How we feel about something doesn't matter and it doesn't change either the facts or the projections. But if we have to tack an adjective onto AGW, perhaps it should be E for expensive because while we can't objectively measure how catastrophic something is, we can estimate the cost. If we take just sea level rise alone, millions of properties representing trillions of dollars worth of assets will be permanently lost to a higher sea level in the top 20 cities at risk. Then we have to add the increased cost of damage from hurricanes, because although there'll be fewer of them, each one that does happen will be longer lasting and more powerful. 
Researchers estimate total damage from hurricanes will increase by about 30% in real terms. Then add the cost of the fishing industry and agriculture. And, well, the report has already done the sums for us. In 2006, the Stern Review estimated the cost of climate change will be at least 5% of world GDP over the next 200 years. But that figure rises to 20% if feedbacks and other factors are taken into account. Of course, you can always argue that these estimates are too high, in which case, what is the cost? However you want to work it out, it seems that the cost is so high that it's much easier for some people to pretend that the problem doesn't exist in the first place. Let's misquote the science and change all the graphs and blame it on the sun or galactic rays. Let's pretend the ice isn't melting and sea levels aren't rising and that there's no correlation between CO2 and temperature. That way, we don't even need to look at the cost. And let's suggest that fixing the problem will bring an end to world civilization. Now, some politicians want to label carbon dioxide a pollutant. Imagine if they succeed. What would our lives be like then? I'm not alarmed by these scary videos any more than I'm alarmed by climate change. That's right. Climate change doesn't alarm me because we identified the problem decades ago. We know the cause. And there's no reason why human will and ingenuity can't fix it. Countries that accept climate science are already starting to develop clean energy technologies that were unheard of a decade ago. And on the other side of the coin, they're also becoming much more energy efficient. So much so that it's now possible to have buildings that don't use any net energy and households that not only produce their own electricity, but sell a surplus back to the grid. Already Denmark gets nearly a third of its electricity from wind power. It's possible to make gasoline from waste biomass that would otherwise rot on the ground. Research is going into fuel cells that can store and transport energy much more efficiently. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what future technologies might be able to achieve. Of course, these technologies, even combined with greater energy efficiency, will never completely replace fossil fuels because our energy demands are just too large. But they don't have to. They just have to reduce CO2 emissions and slow down the warming. Eventually, humankind will have the technology to manage nuclear fusion, which will give us unlimited clean energy. But only if we put enough effort and resources into the research. And that's the problem. The amount we've spent on developing the world's first nuclear fusion reactor is barely two-thirds the cost of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico three years ago. So, no, I'm not alarmed by climate change because we do know how to mitigate the problem and eventually fix it if we apply our minds to it and recognize that there is a problem. What does alarm me is that people are so badly educated in basic science that they're willing to blindly believe the misleading crap they read in blogs and newspapers. I'm alarmed at the willingness of politicians to ignore the science because they don't understand it and turn instead to their own beliefs. In other words, I'm not alarmed by a problem that our intelligence will allow us to mitigate. I'm alarmed at our ignorance and gullibility that leads us to willfully ignore it.